All right. So thanks for thanks uh, for coming, everybody. I, you know, this is uh, exciting, right? First uh, first lecture demo. Um, you know, student run. Now, for those of you that are new, kind of like just joining in uh, from Alex's server, um, this is a, a kind of workshop thing that we're trying trying to run. Uh, just I guess for for as long as it survives, basically, and uh, it really is more about other people doing demos. Um, you know, everyone in here has, uh, or everyone that's part of the original kind of uh, group, has taken my classes before. They know what I'm going to say and this and that. So this is really more of a, you know, trying to help each other out. You know, just spread the information as well as give you practice in terms of uh, just kind of talking in front of people and doing demos. So um, for those of you that are here. Um, you know, definitely, if you're ever trying to, you know, if you're, if you're interested in doing something like this, please sign up. Uh, you know, Jason Lum and uh, Dilla have been kind of facilitating a lot of this. Uh, I don't know how official it is between who's really taking control of this, but, uh, you know, we want to kind of go into 2023 um, kind of doing more stuff like this, right? It could be topic, it could be anything, right? And I think art is really cool, <clears throat> where it's like, you know, Alex is doing a, a rendering thing right now, but... Um, I'd love to have conversations on like, you know, mental health, um, you know, business things, you know, and uh, just social media, this and that, like literally anything. So uh, anything that you guys have in mind that you want to talk about, uh, obviously, um, you know, there's a there's a level of experience that we are kind of trying to achieve. Right. If you are a super beginner student, you know, maybe hold on to it for a second um, and maybe at, maybe put in requests that way people can kind of pick it up but if you are a more advanced student um you know from uh you know advanced to maybe entry level pro you know it, this really is the time for you to kind of like start promoting yourself more and you know there's i don't know 20 25 people here so it's a, it's a good chance to kind of get to know uh for others to get to know you stuff like that so uh but that's enough for me um i guess uh thanks for coming and uh yeah alex all yours dude cool thank you kenny and thank you for facilitating doing this it's cool to bring i didn't know you could invite everyone at once so having all Yo, this dude, I, I didn't together. either man so yeah we're, there's gonna be a lot of bugs in this as well this is the first one so you know please uh excuse that but uh, we'll we'll get through it <laughs> yeah it should be fun and it's totally not professional most of it is handwritten so <laughs> all right we'll get started and my lecture is going to be on finishing and finishing pieces so it's one thing that I want to make clear about this talk is that it's not necessarily a lecture on rendering in because rendering is its own can of worms with uh, what you could spend hours and hours going over fundamentals of light and how to stylize rendering on materials or go photorealistic and stuff instead this is finishing. So that means what does it take to make what you just put on paper feel like it's releasable? And so that's the goal that we want to talk about in this. Um, when breaking this down, I, I had come to that realization as I was putting this together that the talk was not necessarily going to be over rendering. I felt that that wasn't really what contributed to a finished piece and not what I wanted to talk about. So I came up with the three R's. I came up with it myself. Thank you very much. So um, I call it refinement, realization, and rendering. So these three stages, uh, most of your piece is going to be dependent on the first two. And it's kind of like one of those things of like pick two, and then the, the third one isn't as important, but it's, it would be a nice bonus. Um, refinement, and we'll go over all of these in detail, refinement would be like the setup of your piece. Realization instead is, uh, does it feel coherent, lived in, and thought out? And then rendering is the spice on top. It's the, the finishing, the making it pretty kind of thing. So there's wiggle room on how tight you want to push things, the style, how loose, the approach. And all three of these categories support each other. And I think it's actually kind of important to note that rendering is actually the least important. So when we jump in and talk about the refinement stage, what does that mean? That is talking about silhouettes, the value structure, 
big, medium, small, design, consistency, lighting, and mood. So it can really be anything. It's like, do you have a black and white composition? Um, if the silhouettes are defined and the value structure is clear, it's going to feel presentable and finished. Same goes for a loose image in, here in the top right. I'll get draw so that you guys can see. So here, this silhouette is messy and I in many instances you might not call it finished but because of the value structure and you have clear shadow shapes um, he, it's presentable so there there's this thing about knowing when to stop and we'll talk about that as we bring up more examples but finishing is also dependent on like stages of your refinement. Um, if you stick in the refinement stage and it's just values, it's just color, it's just line, you can live in that world and that's enough to finish a piece, which is evident here, here, and here. They uh, avoid lighting, they avoid rendering, and they, they know that if you were to introduce anything else on top, you are now moving into the rendering stage and that uh, brings up a whole can of worms so you have to know when to stop so you can actually present and finish a piece just in the refinements refinement stage alone okay so um i was reading through paul richard's blog site um, again that name is paul richard's and he's got a website called autodestruct.com. Um, please do take note that some of the links on there are not safe for work, like very much so. But look for the design lectures. And on those, he has fantastic, fantastic uh, bits of knowledge. He's a prolific concept designer and mostly draws. Um, some of the stuff that I found interesting from the website I wanted to share with you guys and so he has one mantra called the power of three and when he draws stuff everything is dependent on making you know good uh, pleasing designs in the refinement stage. That That's where everything kind of sits on top. That's the structure of your piece. So you might have like three defining features to a person, like a, a really long nose, a bulky neck, and some weird hat. You might have three main masses of something that, like that. Um, big, medium, and small is in here, are three dominant values of. So these are things like quick tips that you can keep in mind when working on your refinement. And I'll share this presentation afterwards so that you guys can either find the website if you need or just refer to this. I won't go through all of these, um, but I think it's good to keep in mind. Some other parts that he mentions are um, a few things like big, medium, and small. And so I felt that these were like good must-haves when designing for a successful refinement stage. Um, he talks about having an anchor point or a focal point. That could be like if you have a composition and something's going on here, you want everything to focus on this. Or it could be in the design stage. Uh, Cynics has a talk on YouTube about how everything has something that makes it instantly recognizable. So what's the thing that we instantly recognize about a car? It's the wheels. And that would be its anchor point. You can draw anything on top, technically, like excuse my awful sketching, and it will somewhat read as a car because it has wheels. Same for a gun. If you have, um, what's this part? The part that your hand grabs, the, the handle. <laughs> You can put anything on top of this, and it's going to read as a gun. 
so anchor points are really important. I'm tapering thick to thin, big into small, so that's the layering and juxtaposition of small objects. Silhouettes. And then good is in the details. And what he means by that is once you have everything up here done, you can add things that provide history and weathering and damage, things like that. Stuff that tells a story and makes things more identifiable. So if you look at your piece and you describe it as a frogman with an ax, that might not be enough to present that in a finished state. What's going to be something that really finishes it, you know? A bandaged, hunchbacked frogman with a skull axe. It's much more uh, decisive and clear in its statement. So next, we're talking about the second R, and that's realization. So I like to think of realization as the, like, thought process, uh, like, thinking through your refinement, right? So you might have a drawing already, and I love this from Paul Richards' blog site. You might have a drawing, and it's a pipe. That pipe is not finished. It's what does finish it is this. But nothing is necessarily changed in the render, so what, what did he add? Um, it was connections, transitions, and caps. Once you start thinking about this tip, it's it's a huge game changer in basically anything you create. It's the idea that nothing in life exists without transitioning to another thing. It, things don't just hard stop. There's usually something along the way that is going to allow for a transition to that thing. Um, so for example, here on his uh, workbook, he talks about organics, a tree on some land. Um, that never happens. Instead, it makes more sense to have rocks, ferns, uh, overlap of uh, grass and leaves, and instantly your sketch feels more realized and like you took the time to think about what is actually happening in the scene that you're creating. On a more, on a prop level, it's a, a great way to instantly improve your designs as well. So this is a fairly functional sword. You know, you, you know what it is. It is a sword. But is it a successful design, something that you would call finished? Not necessarily. So he adds cuts at the connections and caps at the ends of points, literally capping this, and then has transitions into this neck. So that's a huge one. I, I love that tip, and after reading that, I, I usually hold that pretty close. Um, so furthermore, realization is about the authenticity and the believability of the scene. So when you're looking at an environment Really, this is only a few main elements, and the rest is just set dressing for the realization. When they started off with the sketch, chances are they had a perspective grid, and they were mostly focusing on the positioning and the layout of the, um, the level design. So how do you make this believable in an effective environment? you start adding transitions, caps, and connections, right? Yep. So you've got a couple rocks. Well, you don't want just one rock. You're going to transition it away with big, medium, and small and start having that fade away to imply detail. You start getting into the rocky area. You transition it with fades in the texture, some different objects, big, medium, and small. And then you can see it itself in the building designs that it's not just a box, 
there's usually some additional piece of architecture, some sort of cap on top that makes it feel more ornate. In some ways, you can think of this like repeating shapes, and that's a very easy way to make a design more realized. So if you have a box and you need to quickly make this look like it's been designed in space, well, what if you just add a couple connection points and then cap it off? Now that's, you know, it's a little more realized than it was. And then you add some grass, some rocks, some broken pieces, and then you weather this down. And now this is a realized idea. Um, so that's the core of this stage. The final stage of the three R's would be rendering. And something important about rendering that I wanted to talk about um, is that rendering is not necessarily the crazy League of Legends, um, you know, hyper-polished stuff. Rendering is, at its core, mostly just um, lighting, taking into account lighting properties. Um, Kenny broke it down once for me like over a year ago that um, you can make something look rendered so long as every plane is being affected. So if you have um, a box, I'll get this going, and you have one side is in shadow, and one side is in the half tones. It feels relatively rendered just because each side is being affected. You've got a primary light side, one side is in half tone, one's in the shadow. So these two images at a glance look pretty similar, right? But all I did was I took this photo, which has bounce light, some textural information, folds, little, you know, greeblies and uh, noise and I painted it down so that the um, box, for example, and the cloth are single values. So this has been simplified down to single values with limited texture information, no bounce light. Um, the only thing that has a gradation is the sphere, just to indicate the form. Um, so what I want to what I want people to take away is that rendering doesn't necessarily have to be super impressive, flashy, uh, crazy texturing and, and detail polish. Um, effective rendering, as viewed in this image, is just affecting planes so that you can indicate geometry. As long as you are effectively showing that this is the top, that's the side, that part is really in shadow, that's basically a rendered rock. He's got a little bit of highlight for the lip here. And that's about it. At this scale, you don't need anything to be crazy detail. So all that happens is indicating planes and then using gradients on top, like an overlay layer, to add implied lighting. So for instance, you can By using a gradient, you can make that feel a lot brighter and imply that lighting. Or you can make it a lot darker, that sort of thing. So I think that's a nice thing to keep in mind for finishing something quickly. You don't need to go crazy on rendering, and this was important for me to discover as well. Um, it's just, it's all about lighting each plane differently and then textural detail is the, bu the bonus on top. And then some additional stuff that I wanted to talk about with finishing is um, effects and motion. So I, I love C.T. Chrysler and their work, and I thought this was a really cool image to use to display the impact 
of effects. This is just a line drawing with flat colors and some basic light shapes and a highly unfinished background. It's, you know, like it's, it's very loose. It's not really indicated, but it shows us what we need to see. Um, the part that makes this feel realized, I guess, if we're talking about the R's, is that there's the inclusion of all these effects, things that make it feel like it was basically shot on camera. Um, we've got depth of field, so the, these parts being blurred in the background, it's depth of field. Um, chromatic aberration is the use of um, displacing all the color channels like Spider-Verse, so things go out of focus. And then you can do special effects, so blooming, um, different power indications. The, they both allow us to have arc lines, so there's a nice gesture within the piece itself. It shows motion, um, or you can affect the camera itself and treat it as a real object in the scene. So putting dust on the camera or having a lens flare because it's, uh, it's overexposing and catching on the, on the lens. Um, one thing that Kaysen shared with me before is that he doesn't like to finish any piece without adding some type of motion. And I, I think that's indicated really well here because one, uh, the character's gesture is implying that she's jumping or she's excited at something that just happened. But two, we have uh, dust billowing in the background showing this kind of directionality and on top of that we have this effect. So you're able to get a better read off of the image because of the way the effects are allowing us to feel the scene. Um, so different things that you can do to add motion would again be power effects, um, rain. Rain is really good at showing direction directionality. You can subtly show indications of wind in a sort of like anime or manga style where like if you um, use an overlay layer or something, you can kind of um, add these little gliding motions that they don't have to be very strong, but you can kind of show that there's motion in the scene, some sort of gestural flow. And I think that helps quite a bit. Okay. So on to the big bad boy, the, the thing that I think people are probably wondering about when they think about finishing and rendering a piece, and that's splash art. Um, I wanted to uh, show a splash art and basically break it down with you guys and analyze what they're doing that makes this look so great. Um, and let's go into that. Okay, so I took I took the liberty of doing some notes already. Whoops. And we're going to talk about all of the different finishing techniques that I had brought up and how they're being used here. So first thing I notice, depth of field. The depth of field basically softens all of the background and it helps add hyper clarity to the foreground. So the fact that this is basically pixel perfect um, makes this feel razor sharp in light of all of the soft edges in the background. And then we've got um, effects and motion. So the inclusion of big, medium, and small in the um, debris. We've got clouds. We've got glitter. So the clouds are giving off particulate. And then these leaves of various colors are both big, medium, and small shapes. Makes them feel very natural. Um, on top of that, we've got a few lighting techniques and we'll talk about them if we get around to them, but one thing that, if you guys don't know it, is the Fresnel effect. And 
all that is is basically the idea that we have a sphere and um, oops okay if you have a sphere you can make it look more believable by basically including Fresnel and that means that basically uh, as light planes shift away from you they're catching more light because they ref uh, they reflect and bounce off towards you and kind of hyper realize so if this is a plane and light is coming down I don't think I'm demonstrating this well it makes it to your eye the more parallel it is to your eye the more reflection you get so you can see that kind of indicated almost everywhere all edges here have um, additional light on the edges where they catch more so just minor fresnelling on basically everything this also applies to beveling which would be on a box cutting off the edge and more light catches here um, in general because it, it's the bouncing sorry the angle is adjusting so that the light catches your eye more and that's indicated here there, basically everywhere um, detail and clarity is provided by using edge highlights with, which is the Fresnel effect but stylized and basically deciding that no matter where you are every single edge in this piece is being defined and you can see those strokes everywhere so here here it's it's an extension of that idea of that every plane must be lit if you take that to its furthest possible end point and you start thinking about like what's the material here is it layered how thick is it how thin is it that is going to catch light don't ignore that so then you add edge detail um, that very easily allows you to to make things feel more rendered um, then of course we've got bounce light and textural detail on top but one thing that I found cool is that uh, in right excuse me in riot splash art in particular no shape is undesigned and so by that you can see here even with soft highlights there is a clear shape if you look at it and I'll switch over to the main illustration so it's not covered by lines when you look at this there is an identifiable um, shape here this highlight has been turned into a triangle the folds have been simplified and turned into this shape and then softened away you can find that and identify that everywhere even highlights have shape it's basically this shape here and that's part of what gives riot splash art that feeling of cool like that cool factor everything is designed and not, nothing is untouched okay um, other things I wanted to talk about were well just evidence of all all behaviors of light on the arm here this feels rendered because one it has a rim light from the back a bounce light from the gold it's got ambient light from the sky reflecting off the center here and then the core shadow is in the main area so it's being lit from all directions and essentially feels hyper rendered and you can look in here and see how everything has an edge detail basically a line drawing and makes things feel very sharp okay so some more tips from paul richards oh yeah. um hmm? i'm ahead. sorry could you go back yeah i just wanted to take a screenshot of it thank you i'll share this afterwards as well 
and for anyone if you have questions feel free to interject it's fine um, it'll make it more of a discussion rather than me rattling off but I'm close to finishing the talk and then I'll just demonstrate some pieces that I've done and how I've finished them but a little bit more here is Paul Richards finishing tips um, some cool things that if you didn't know now you know is uh, work large and then reduce size so if you have something and you've got a bunch of details you drew something big and then you shrink that down it instantly makes it look sharper so if I zoom in on this now you can't tell over stream with all the aliasing but in general work with like a 4k image shrink it down to 1080 it's gonna look really sharp um, had a friend who just point blank ask Jamie Jones on Twitter <laughs> how, how, how do you get all that detail in your paintings and he said um, some of it is detailing but a lot of it is just because I paint at 8k and then you see it on your Twitter thumbnail it just it looks sharper um, uh, work the whole so this is the idea that I was mentioning earlier that there are stopping points there's basically like a drawing phase a spot black phase, a flat color, cell shading, basic lighting, and then full on render. And I'll shrink that down, sorry. Whoa, okay, never mind. Too late. Uh, so the idea here is that you can stop at any one of these points and that's a good finishing ground the moment you move past that it's going to make your piece look unfinished because one thing is now rendered beyond the indications of anything else in your piece of course there is the idea that you want the thing in focus or closer to the foreground to be to have the most detail and but it's a fine line of balance you know so uh, generally if you keep to these ideas you can stop at a certain point and have it maintain a finished feel without kind of screwing things up for yourself by requiring more work because you went too far um, some of the other things are having the idea of line weight being thicker on shadow sides and outlines allows for things to feel finished um, spotting black uh, this is Q Feng I believe he's taught at Brainstorm um, in his he's an overwatch character designer and he does flat colors with spotted blacks so shadow shapes basically and throw those all over the place it feels intricate it feels detailed it feels done and then tone and color and then the one last thing I wanted to talk about here is uh, again this is Q Feng and he has his own little quick rendering style I'm sure it's for production purposes where he doesn't indicate any bounce light or shadow shapes he only indicates uh, highlights for materials So notice when you zoom in here, nothing is lit that crazy. There is shadows. So this has a shadow side. I see there, like this is dark, this is medium, and that's light. So there, there is definition there. But the majority of the time is spent defining these highlights because that's what's telling us the important information of this design, which is the, the fact that these are metallic and this is not. So notice the cloth shapes don't even have shading to them the only parts that do are the metals uh, there's no shadows no shadows not even soft stuff the only stuff that has rendering detail is the part that needed to be indicated and made clear and that was the metal okay so I'm just going to be talking about pieces that I have done because you know I have like workflows so I went back and collected things and I'm not like any uh, pro 
on rendering or anything, but I, I would talk about some of the things that I've learned over the past year that I think have helped push my work to a level that I, I wasn't capable of previously. And so some things here is I spent a lot of time on the realization stage. So everything, um, and yes, Tony, this is for Township Tale, the VR game at my studio, and they don't have legs, so uh, the characters don't have legs. But the painting, nothing is rendered at a crazy level. Uh, it's mostly like loose strokes. Um, some trees are literally just light and shadow shapes. But the part that makes things feel complete is that there's the inclusion of all sorts of stuff. We've got individual blades of grass being shown to us. We've got flowers with stems because they would be in the field. We've got some rocks. We've got trees, different trees. We've got multiple lakes. We've got reflections. We've got different houses. Small things that are just pixel just a couple pixels showing that there's stuff way off in the distant distance, a well, a gate, all of that. Um, so that was me taking the time to realize this space and indicate it in a way that felt believable. And then because of the inclusion of all of this stuff, the piece feels complex and it feels done without you having to push render qual quality beyond like a reasonable time frame of effort. Here was a building callout. Um, the thing that I was most proud of with this was the fact that it was realized. So that was kind of a big uh, discovery for me this past year. Was just like if you go deeper, things will feel more finished. Um, so we've got shops, we've got signs got all sorts of stuff and because of the inclusion of these things it's more plausible to feel like this had been thought through and uh, an actual set location the rendering quality is just the finishing to indicate the materials and like Alex, I have a question yeah what do you what's find up Michi most challenging, oh sorry what do you find the most challenging part of this whole process by the way of the whole process? Pretty much the finishing process, per se. Mm, I, I do think, um, for me, it's, it's the realization stage. So mm. when you go back and you think about everything that makes something feel complete, that's more important. And that's essentially rooted in design thinking. Um, I love this piece from Intergalactic because uh, Rob Rupel was pushing the graphic art style harder than has ever been done before on feature animation. It's flatter than Spider-Verse still. Um, but this is immaculate, you know? It's super thoughtful and dense. And because of that, it feels hyper done, you know? Like, it, it, it feels immensely detailed, but nothing is actually rendered, you know? Um, we have the indication of light shapes. So thinking through, like, what does my set actually require? What's the baseline level of detail in just any given space? Uh, Shadi Shafadi, Shadi, Shadi Shafadi, uh, head of One Pixel Brush, talks about that's what sets the artists there apart. He calls them uh, psychopaths because people like Aaron Lamonic and uh, others, sorry, blanking on names they go down to that minute attention to detail that if you have a street and that street has you know pavement maybe you've got this lip that has some kinds of bricks and then you have larger paved bricks here maybe there's some scuffing from where things have been walked around you've got some cracking maybe from uh, the weather changing then leaves are going to start building up uh, probably in the gutter you've got oil marks from when it rained and it's been flowing into the gutter um, more build up maybe a trash bag people leaving cups behind 
some footprints visible, uh, some gum spots, and then as you move to a doorway, there's always some sort of transition on the facades, usually some sort of sign for the opening. So it's all of that that makes a sketch feel realized, you know? And I, I found that that's definitely the hardest part. Uh, it's not really difficult, you know, at a certain point to be able to draw, to be able to render. Um, the thing that really sets your piece apart is whether it feels lived in, I think, or at least comprehensive. It doesn't necessarily have to feel lived in, but for instance, this painting feels very rich. There's a um, huge, big, medium, and small shapes all around, and it feels very rendered, but these are all graphic hard shapes. Um, they, there's no soft edges uh, um, to that piece, so I, I love that one. And so rendering is kind of just, it's at a certain point once you learn the light rules, you're just kind of thinking, is this being hit by light? Which part of the light is it being hit by? And then you just do that. It's not necessarily difficult, you know? So um, I do think in the finishing process, the one that people should be most concerned with and I find the most difficult is the realization. And yeah. Yeah. One thing I wanted to talk about here in this piece is the transition of detail from light to shadow. So um, there's nothing too crazy. It is one value here. A second value is some implied ambient light and just two uh, lazy strokes. The thing that really shows off the detail, the render detail, is just more stuff, more um, silhouette breaks. So, in transitioning to the dark side by showing us, by breaking the silhouette, showing how those leaves are coming in and out, um, all this together is what makes that tree feel done. And essentially that's realization. It's not rendering, you know? So there's nothing crazy going on here. Anybody at any skill level can do this. This is one value, second value, really dark value. The thing that makes this feel rendered is just the idea that it's uh, it's been fully realized. Um, then another thing I had done was I talked about realization, so there was one stage where I, I pushed this image farther by adding additional things, stuff that made it feel, you know, like there was more going on. Repetition, inclusion of nature, um, changes in the geometry of the landscape. And then for the rest of the talk, I'm just talking about different kinds of finishes and why they feel done. So on this page we've got um, black and white, basically line drawing finishes. And they're carried mostly by the detailing of their line and solid values. And you'll find that that is a um, like a really prominent undercurrent <laughs> for all of these pages. Um, if it weren't just for solid values but you wanted this to feel extra, extra done. It's all of these small shapes, really small, big, medium, small. You've got big stuff, and then you have juxtaposition to make it feel really thought through. Nothing here is too crazy. There's just a lot of it, and it makes it feel comprehensive is another way to put it. Um, one part here, though, is um, not even detailing things that are in shadow. They're only living off of silhouettes. And so silhouettes are hugely important. If you can indicate something in a mostly finished silhouette, you can basically leave it that way so long as you detail for the light or the shadow side, which is what happens here. Uh, Ryan Magno gives us all of the detail with shadow shapes in the light. And again, he's thinking about all those transitions 
and caps on doors, uh, graffiti, noise, and generally things that show us that he's really thought about this piece. So it's, uh, it feels finished. I would, cons I would call that presentable. Um, and the only thing that would really push that is just, you know, like refining some things. So, oh, I drew in the wrong layer. But some of these are basically really noisy. And if you wanted that to be like, you know, really, really done, you might just clean up the silhouettes. So big takeaway, strong silhouettes and good values can push something into feeling done. But even if you have a line drawing, um, in the Paul Richards notes, he talks about presenting things tonally. So just breaking things down of dark, that's a B, dark, medium, and light. That's enough to, to make this finished and presentable, and you don't have to push it any farther. Here we've got um, basically low, low tier rendering, like for the Max Grecky example. Um, you've got shadows, you've got highlights, and then I found this interesting that this is, and by all regards, um, an unfinished drawing. It's like there's no face <laughs> and there's not really much going on here but the core idea is being shown and then look at the inclusion of effects and motion having all of this here makes us feel more realized we've got big medium and small so we're thinking through debris we're thinking through motion and then the core idea the refinement is just the silhouettes so you can, there's kind of this like gradient of finishing quality and everything can hold up so long as, you know, things gel together. So they're, they're gelling together because the colors are all the same, you know, the characters are recognizable in silhouette, and then the detail shifts in and out and you have one primary indication of high detail as the splash on the page. Here's some quick comps from Kevin Knutson. Um, I found these cool because in this one especially there's no detail here. Why does it work though? It has really really defined shapes. Um, the value structure is incredibly clear. You've got bright. If we put this in the black and white, it takes a little bit of time on Procreate. You can't just proof colors. But the core statement is there. And so what, on that balancing of all of the different stages, he chose that he didn't need to show uh, density of detail, which is kind of what I've been implying is necessary in the realization stage. He doesn't include all that. Instead, it's about the anchor point of the image, what Paul Richard, Paul Richard had mentioned, that focal point. And then really successful values, colors, and silhouette. And so thanks to that, it feels finished. That same thing goes here. There's a little more detail, but really it's just the inclusion of shapes that make this feel like it was given some thought and time. And then very strong graphic reads in a strong composition that throws it all together. And the same idea goes here. These are just graphic shapes, but it feels finished. If you could push this further, of course, depending on what you're trying to go for. But in terms of their goal here, mood research, this is essentially a finished painting. And nothing more, nothing less. You have the inclusion of every necessary element to finish this idea. You have a variety of big, medium, and small. You have motion and gesture. 
and the repetition of things to make it feel like the world is going beyond stopping here. So this one is kind of a doozy. Uh, Lorenzo Lanfranconi, he has a very high finish level. But one thing I, I find interesting is that it's not crazy rendering. So again, this is what I would call realization because it's really just thinking through all of the ways foliage changes and transitions along the landscape. You've got your rock, then you've got grass and moss growing on that rock, then you've got flowers, then you've got some dirt. It's all of that, the inclusion of that, that makes it feel realized. And then he just does it to a very detailed degree. And all that's really here is light and then shadow. There's not a lot of bounce. There's not a lot of ambient lighting. It's mostly just contained in those values. So when you think of it that way, you can kind of look at this as just thinking, okay, well, we need a lot of variety. We need to think about the ways of the landscape changes between bushy grass, flat grass, and um, it feels more realized as a result rather than it being necessarily like League of Legends landscape hyper fidelity. Like look at this foreground. It's noise, basically. But it feels finished, it feels realized. Here on the opposite side is very um, simplistic rendering but it shows us what we need to know. We've got shadow, we've got Fresnel, and then we have designed highlight shapes that indicate this material to us. Otherwise, they use a trick of showing us different brush shapes, strokes, to make the grass look finished. And that's enough. But the inclusion of moss, I would say, is the realization here. Here we've got very simple character drawings and I would say this feels finished I don't know that I would want to push that any further than it already is so you again it's talking about those decisive stopping points um, knowing when to stop allows something to feel finished because it's kind of breathing in its own skin um, you allow this gesture to live and die by the ink strokes here we've got confident shapes, no detail, but the value structure is really strong. And so the values are, are holding this up. It's basically just flat color. And then same here, it's sustaining off of a strong drawing, and then material indication on the clothing, and then everything else is basically super simple, like no decisive shadows, um, nothing crazy. One thing I did want to talk about is the degradation of detail. Uh, Ming Chen Shen is a master at this, making paintings feel really, really well rendered in the foreground. But then with each tier going back, he reduces the detail. So you've got a great render on the character here. And great poses, we've got bounce light as the materials are indicated, there's a lot of stuff going on here. And then you go one stage back and characters don't have as much detail. You go to the third one and then it's just colors and value with most things in shadow being obfuscated. And then you go to the fourth stage and it's just a silhouette. There's no rendering going on here at all. So that's really a really good time saver and something that I, we can all learn from, something I definitely need to learn from. I, thi I think some League of Legends splash arts, what sets them apart is that their degradation of detail uh, requires going further back before it gets really simplified. Like you, you can go to this building or here and there's still the inclusion of like three or four different values. Um, 
that's pretty detailed for being so far in the background but granted these are kind of focal buildings so they warrant a little bit more attention and it's only until you get to the far far back that you just have indicated shapes so I think that's what really sets them apart is they keep up that detail for longer and it, it really makes things feel like uh, you know really really done and then this is my favorite kind of stuff here's some more painterly splash and backgrounds from arcane this is talking about the idea that every plane needs to be lit differently to look rendered when you look here this is a really simple and deceivingly difficult shot to to make feel finished um, for the arcane style but the idea is that basically no surface is left untouched they change their colors and in order to indicate changes in planes so you can tell this is a top side and this is a side side just because of the change in value and so when you start thinking about that it's not really rendering you you're thinking about value groups and whoa that's an overlay layer when you zoom out it's all just one gray shape. But you get more detail by changing colors to indicate changes in planes. And that's essentially what rendering is, I guess. I, I know I just said that they're not rendering, but that is what rendering is. So excuse me. It's just indicating different planes. The more detailed you go, the more rendered it becomes. So, um, here is the control of detail. So one thing that I noted is that this feels very, very finished. Um, keep messing up. There's just a lot of stuff here. There's a lot of silhouettes. There's transitions and detail. There's little moss, and they're they're not rendered, right? It's just blurbs of things just stuff and that's what I really liked about this painting is people can get to this level because everything here is at most uh, one two three three values one two and three and the only thing that is more than three values is the hero so that's where the render time is spent that's what shows up on the card and then everything else is extra and so when you go and look in the background what is making this feel done if it's not for the actual like painting polish it's the fact that there's a lot of variation in the silhouette so the realization is resting on the refinement stage the the actual drawing it's basically a coloring book with a lot of detail to it that makes it feel done. There's vines, there's leaves, there's flowers, things coming up, things floating in the air. So all that together makes this feel really polished. And then this is kind of just like that final hyper push. That feels really detailed. So by extension, you know that everything else could be. The same idea goes for the majority of backgrounds in Arcane, which I love. So um, there's implied detail, and everything is resting on the silhouettes. So mostly the refinement of the three R's. Because when you zoom in, this grass is not that rendered. It is two values, and there's not even a gradient on it itself. You go back, these silhouettes aren't even like tight. <laughs> but it's the idea that they're all here and they form um, a, a really good composition and then everything is resting on values so here the values are doing the work and it's less so the rendering you have minor variation at most there's three values going on 
and then even like internal brush shapes are very loose here it's very loose this is not that tight but it feels done because that value statement is there so repeat with me what is the big takeaway here it's the values and drawing <laughs> better drawings better values and then you can finish most things and i promise i'll wrap up uh, soon these are just some finishings uh, where from my own pieces that you might think um, is this done well i don't know we can push things a little further so in most of my paintings i usually go through and i think about what else could be done here that i'm not necessarily pleased with for me it was um, better shadow values so i added sh soft shading to get better occlusion because i didn't really successfully capture that with the planar rendering style that i had set out to uh, work on so i used an overlay layer on top and just added that implied lighting to kind of fix that stuff and that basically uh, finished that piece here is a process on rendering um, this painting I did. Everything kind of starts off with this core value statement, and then the inclusion of more stuff makes this feel realized. So on top of that is just minor adjustments with overlay, adding bloom, um, vignetting a little bit. adding additional props and then finishing off with some effects so bloom mostly overexposure hey Alex yeah what's up did you send these layers with your um, presentation too yeah I will I'll, awesome. I'll just export the whole presentation great thank you appreciate it mm -hmm. you did a good job thanks here um, a van in a field all green that's boring so realize it by adding flowers and clouds uh, a better you know transition to the ground in the grass and then finish off with some mood basically some ex additional lighting on top here this one was more a little more rendered so the rendering approach here was starting off with noise adding text and going over that text to add web distressing to them and then stronger shadows and light and then finish off with some vignettes and edge highlights so stuff like that We are getting close to the end. We've got this drawing, then adjust values so it's got a stronger statement, add effects, and you know this is basically filling in the the image. So it's effects, but I would call it in some manner realization because this is adding to the gestural statement of the piece and then fish for additional motion here this might be done in some regards but we can keep going we add more variety in the fields add some clouds giving a better value read on the hills then i'm showing motion in the sky and the clouds adding to that gestural flow and then on top of that I'm pushing that lighting and also emphasizing lines and adding motion and smoke to the car last one here it's a fire and then it's just like how far can you push this explosion that could be enough or this fire i mean 
it could be enough to stop there but you know it's like if you want to capture the core idea and really demonstrate what this is about then let's push that further let's get if this can kind of go in an abstract manner so let's get more brush strokes in there different shapes let's uh, start introducing more subtle variations in color let's keep pushing it let's add texture let's add some blooming some vignetting I'm emphasizing some shapes here with the way the shadows kind of I added some deeper value and then I added more motion on top with that overlay trick that I had shown you guys earlier which was just providing us gestural lines to make that feel more dynamic on top okay so uh, that leaves us with um, the activity so if you guys want to talk first if you want to ask anything about the the lecture as a whole that's that went on longer than I said that it would so feel free to leave if you want after this um, we're gonna be painting so I have provided in the study reference channel a PSD with a drawing that I had put together and for the next hour I will basically be painting it uh, with my typical process and you're free to follow along or do whatever you'd like whoa go away please I do have a quick question actually mm -hmm. um when you uh create your uh value read do you usually use a three value system uh like preferably for process or do you um I guess how do you prefer to structure your values usually or does it is it does it depend from piece to piece and all yeah Kenny would be really disappointed in me I'm only just now realizing um, that uh, values are <laughs> are better solved up front but for a long time I've kind of jumped into getting a piece going with like a, a lighting statement but my value structure isn't quite there and so I felt that this was kind of a good example of it. As this progressed, the values got more and more refined. So I'm constantly going through uh, and checking my values until I end up on ones that work better in the end. Um, I do have an idea of what I, I want to go in, but I don't necessarily have like a, a core one, two, three read. So <laughs> that's something that I need to address going forward no that's really interesting thank you yeah oops I'm trying to get back to my yeah there we go if anybody wants to speak up or ask questions or feel free to talk this can be very casual now I'm no longer in lecture mode Um, Alex, could you explain a little bit more about uh, Fresnel for, for I don't know. Oh, like what what were you really talking about that with the Fresnel effect? Yeah, let's find some stuff. Okay, so the Fresnel effect is basically the idea that. Um, as things become more parallel to the viewer the pure quality of the light is made more apparent um, this is really identifiable with water so things that are closer to you are less parallel they're more perpendicular to your eye so you're looking through the water which is which is a fairly reflective surface or material you're able to look through it but as things go to the horizon um, it's the light is more parallel with you so the water is actually acting as a mirror and so you are seeing the reflection of the land masses and then even a tip of just pure light at the very end where it's perfectly parallel with the camera on objects this is like on a donut um, it's catching light towards the edges because it's basically the more the geometry wraps around 
the more that light is bouncing parallel to the camera. I, I can't really like demonstrate that. Uh, but you'll see in all of these spheres, the slight Fresnelling on all of these materials is what adds that believability. And if they could be so kind as to show us a before and after, that'd be great. But you can see this little halo on reflective materials, and that's Fresnel. You add that to stuff, it instantly looks more rendered. It's a, it's a quick tip. And then Marco Bucci has a quick talk on the Fresnel effect. Ah, uh, you can't... I can't stand shorts. You can't zoom through this. But he's demonstrating the effect here as well. So you look at this book, it's one value. As it's more parallel, it's catching light and reflecting, and instead of seeing those shadows, it's reflecting light instead, thanks to the Fresnel effect. And then I think another 30 seconds he'll paint one more little demonstration, if you're curious to see it. So I'll leave that up. Yeah, so that increase in the light, basically white, or of the ambient light, um, any round surface, you start doing that, or surfaces that are more parallel to your view, it's going to feel more believable. Yeah, so cool. Yeah, great. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I'm just going to start working on this stuff. I hope that was useful for everybody. That was so good, Alex. Thank you so much. Sure. And yes, I, I will be sharing the presentation. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, okay. Uh, sorry. <laughs> um, do you use the Fresnel effect to showcase the material of an object, or what do you use it for specifically in a piece? Yeah, it would be material. It it's mostly on reflective objects. Everything has reflectivity, um, but not everything is going to reflect at the same strength. So, you know, it's kind of like what do you know about the property, and how far are you going to push it? Um, things like glass or um, chrome, gold, if it's a sphere or if it's a plane that's facing away from you. For instance, uh, this is a gold material, so this is going to have a really strong highlight there because that plane is more per more parallel to us. very parallel to the eye, whereas this one is more perpendicular to us, and so when that light bounces, it's not going to be as strong as this one coming in hot with uh, straight to the camera, the light. So yeah, mostly dependent on material property, and very good for indicating materials at a high level. I wouldn't say that you would be using Fresnel much except for when it adjusts core values of an entire plane like that. When you get to like the really minute rendering a sphere and adding that edge highlight, that's like, you know, really detailed rendering on like the League of Legends level. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank mm -hmm. you.
So what I'm going to be doing now, unfortunately, I didn't have anything that I felt I could present um, that was really close to being done. So I just figured I, I'd stream painting this for an hour. Uh, basically going to be showcasing like how I would approach this. And for sake of time, I'll probably give these rocks to a certain level and then focus on the sword since there's some interesting reflective materials there. Feel free to follow along, the PSD is available in the study reference channel. What's uh, what's your general game plan for kind of like going through uh, this render process? When I start, I always um, get my core shadows defined. And so my my core idea was that I needed some value in the background. I'm pointing at the ribbon. The background, I know that I want things to be focused on this sword. And essentially, the, um, the sword is going to be glinting in light with some sort of, you know, beam of, of light filtering through. And we'll be showcasing the material render on the sword. So the core thing is this vignette. My approach is going to be um, setting up shadows. And getting those to a detailed step. And then I would go through and define highlights. And after that, I would start getting into smaller things like bounce and ambient light. And then depending on the kind of style that you want to push, making things feel a little more realistic, a little softer, you would introduce ambient occlusion. And then small details like edge highlights. And that would be the general process. Um, what I was trying to go through here was, in the, as well was in the base sketch, I wanted to think about the realization of this piece before uh, introducing color. And so that meant transitioning away, uh, how do the rocks transition into the water? We've got pebbles, we've got moss, we've got different kinds of plants, a variety of them vines providing a motion, uh, different things that basically have this feel coherent. So that was my main focus. And then I have an idea of where I'm going, but it's kind of going to be a little free form on getting there and mostly a build up process. Sweet. Thanks. Is that this is usually much more talkative. They're shy. You have a certain oh, oh. <laughs> nice. <laughs> go. You go. Uh, Sorry, no, you go. Oh, uh, no, I gotta say this was really, really helpful. Like I really love the the way you you, you separated refinement from rendering because I just remember I was taking the word building through and I kept looking at those same arcane renders for so long and like I kept uh, color picking and seeing like the value doesn't change but it looks 
like so detailed and yeah. like how so it was really cool awesome i'm glad that was a, a big uh, epiphany for me as well and i f feel like i've been going about things the wrong way um, and things are definitely more it's easier to finish when you get things set up early and then rendering is is kind of just like how far do you want to take it you know but the, the core idea should already be standing before you get to the render like if i wanted to i could just do a flat shadow pass and this could be done as long as i fixed the transitions of the water here and added you know like a couple more rocks kind of thing it's all about choosing where the end point is for the rendering and having everything live off of the refinement and the realization and that was a, a big win for me so i learned something from doing this and that's all we want i wanted to ask what kind of mood are you going for with this piece <laughs> you're exposing my flaws uh, I just know that I want a light beam and I want this to glint um, <laughs> I'm here to sabotage you Alex <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if there's a better way to get there but I usually I find it at the end so I, I'm more focused on rendering this like getting it to a place where the materials are all indicated and then at the end I can use overlays and hard lights to push on lighting and mood or change the colors around in post but in general i know that lights coming down there's going to be a big old reflection and that's about it nice thank you mm -hmm. How do you approach the, um, I guess, the shape language and the shadow shape on the rock? It's a pretty... One thing I've been exploring um, recently is starting with a loose shadow shape and then erasing my shapes in, um, out of there. So it's kind of like uh, forcing myself into thinking about light on dark instead of dark on light. So. I knew that because of the lighting scenario here, it was more important to put everything in shadow and then worry about what is being exposed to the light, rather than saying everything is being everything is light. Uh, let me add shadows where necessary. You know, so I don't know. Perhaps that would put me on a better tier of artist if I had a clearer idea of like the kinds of shapes that I'm using. But I, in general, I'm trying to maintain that there should be some larger shapes and then the smaller ones of things popping out are helping show that um, this isn't necessarily just a flat object so i add stuff because i want to show form and that's kind of the the big thing for me yeah that makes sense thank you yeah, because I'm, I'm I'm trying to do it along with you. I, I my my shapes kind of suck. I'm like, oh shoot, how does he how's he doing that? <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm.
what's your um, logic behind which parts of the foliage to kind of bring into the light versus which ones to put or leave in the shadow? I'm thinking about the geometry of them. And while these are, this, these are flat silhouettes, um, you can help add light direction or tangibility to this by deciding whether this is going to come out and be you know like a a flat leaf or is that something that curves down you know is it is it something that when you look at the side it's flat or is the leaf coming out like this and it's just a really big one you know so i am uh, using light as a shorthand i'm not really thinking about the accuracy and i'm basically saying that this is popping out from the projected shadow here behind this rock um, there's the leaf is big enough that it shows up essentially oh that makes sense thank you mm -hmm. so you're sort of like establishing the light direction first and then sort of doing the foliage and seeing what kind of falls alongside that in yeah a way. yes sense. Bye, Justina, and thank you everyone who uh, has joined and has been leaving lately. I um, hope it's been helpful. So what I'm doing now is I'm using a lasso fill tool in Procreate. Uh, this feature is also available on Clip Studio, or if you use a GitHub um, like extension, I know that it also exists for Photoshop. Um, but it allows me to draw in shapes, so I'm thinking a little more strongly about uh, what I want. I want clean shapes, so it allows me to get those shapes cleaner very quickly. And for things that don't need a whole lasso, just little lines, I get those filled in. So I'm now focusing on cast shadows and shadow shapes on this sword. So that's going to be my main focus for the rest of the piece. I'm going into the ribbon uh, layer, making a clipping mask for multiply. And I made a selection that I'm now going to airbrush in. While I'm doing this, I'm already kind of thinking about bounce light. So I'm not necessarily going full uh, shadow. I'm adding bounce where necessary, kind of thinking about 
where the light terminates and also gradation of value. When you want to get into finer renders, um, you can start thinking about how the light is arcing or gradating on a surface. So if I think about this as the peak of this object, that's where I think the most light is going to reflect off of, um, with the whole thing being get rid of the selection this being the core area of light so I can either work that in with my shadows or I can use an overlay layer and push the light side instead with something brighter and I can add that gradient that kind of shows that that's catching a bit of a crest of highlight um, it peaks there, I guess, it would be the better word. You can add those in, and then when they're airbrushed, take your shadow shapes that have been established on another layer, and clear out that selection so they stay separate. As you kind of look at the sword, which parts do you think um, you're going to focus on detail within? Like, which or which parts do you think are the most crucial to, I guess, the design of the sword? The center jewel um, and the handlebars, and then just getting a good highlight on the blade itself should be fine. I think most of the detail is going to be in the gold, but I, I couldn't tell you why I think that, just... Um, Yeah, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Oh, I mean, it makes sense. Yeah. I think a lot of the design kind of leads to that area, which makes sense. So are you a, are you a Zelda fan of sorts? No, I've never played one. Really? <laughs> yeah, that's fair enough. It's very reminiscent of the series, so it's just very, very fun. just wondering what kind of shapes or details do you watch out for in shadows to keep an eye out for in your rendering what kinds of shapes like do I design my shadow shapes is that what you're asking yeah pretty much um, I can see how you have like some areas on the grass just at the bottom section just lay it out so you can distinguish the shape of there's grass in there but is there something specific you look out for to include through the shadows, like details that just pretty much is insinuated to it? Well, I guess if you're talking about here, these are, um, I, I used the light shape so that I didn't have to paint grass again later. Um, basically, I, I know that this line is getting cut, 
So I, I was just indicating in grass kind of breaking that point. Uh, it, it's thinking about those transitions again. It's like it, it kind of applies everywhere that when you have light, how is that light transitioning to other objects? Is there anything that's poking out? I'm thinking about, or at least trying to think about these as three-dimensional forms and how they'd be breaking out in terms of 3D space. Um, so, uh, let's see. Interesting. So, when you have a cast shadow... Sections, what to watch out for, right? Like transition points between shadow and light? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And that's where, that's where a lot of detail is. If you remember from that uh, tree example that I had shown on my in my lecture that you had a shadow side you don't have to render very complex because you if you show that there are still some leaves that are catching light at this transition then you you have realized detail rather than render detail and that, that's more important so you the 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 leaves are casting shadows, so you get some shadow shapes there. You have some leaves that are poking out from as they transition, so you still get some detail there. And so that becomes how you design the shadow shape rather than... And then you can go more stylized, like if you want to soften it and, 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 uh, and just go for like a really smooth surface kind of thing. But see, thank you. Is there a reason also why you use the multiply layer? It's like, do you use a hue shift through it or any specific reason for it? I like that it's on a separate layer. So um, one, I, I have a shadow shape that I can always go in and select this. And then I can, um, like in the future, going forward, if I was um, going to be drawing ambient light and bounce light, it's very simple for me to grab a brush and then start painting in on the side and it, I'm only painting in on the shadows so uh, let's... thank you could you elaborate more on how you're creating those transition points uh, within the lighting yeah so again it, it it's still what I, I was talking about um, over here on the side. Let me find this. And I'll go back to... Maybe I'll just go back and find that painting. Because I think that's stronger. A stronger example. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... There is almost no like rendering to this. There's no gradients, there's no light shapes, um, like within highlights or anything. There's no edge lights, there's no Fresnel. So why does this feel detailed and finished? It's the fact that the geometry has been spelled out with light shapes. And I, I think that's um, what you guys are trying to ask, right? Um, let me see if I can find this. So when you have an object, it's got a bunch of leaves, and all of those leaves are going to cat are going to be cast in light or shadow. And if I were to tone it, um, it's not dark enough and throw that tree into shadow, some of these leaves are still going to be popping out because they are physically larger and higher than the like just the core spherical shape of this tree. There are going to be some leaves that are sticking out. They're going up vertically. So when the light is shining down on a sphere, it, it might not actually catch any more light because it doesn't have any more lips that are, are of, of physical geometry. But some of these leaves are going to poke out and the light rays 
when they would normally pass the sphere, um, any leaf that is still within that realm of, and you can guesstimate a little bit, is going to catch some light. So you can apply render detail and show the textural quality of that tree by doing that. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And so the same thing is happening here where I'm just adding abstract marks and I'm also thinking about some of these leaves or not even knowing if they really are in light or shadow, but I know that I want to break up the major spaces and I don't want this to be one shadow shape because if you notice, I made the mistake of despite my best efforts of having big, medium, and small, I still ended up with three medium shadow shapes. So it, it'll be a part of my job to come in here and figure out how I can break up those shadow shapes in ways that are going to give me more variety in the graphic reader as, as a whole. Um, so I, I might just change what is actually being lit. And I, I don't know necessarily if it's correct, but um, I, I'll do it anyway and see if it works. So I, I'm not thinking about this here right now. I'm just, I'm thinking, well, this is facing the upper left and it's also, uh, it's also, if I show light, that is going to instantly imply that it's facing upwards and there's some additional geometry there. You're basically creating geometry by subtracting abstract light shapes from that multiply layer. Sorry, I have a bit of a selfish question, no but um, so I'm redesigning my portfolio because what I recently had, it, I didn't show much um, design thinking. I just had some pretty pictures and that's it. Would it be better to, um, because what I'm thinking so far is like of a world building type thing. So I'd be showing like characters and all that stuff. Should it be more specific towards like say an environment or how the story would be pushed through the environment or is it okay to like like show everything in that world as a like a portfolio piece i'm sorry could you repeat that again no I'll, I'll try to make sure i'm, I'm listening no, harder it's my fault you're you're good um i have recently been thinking of redesigning my portfolio and showing um, design understanding and I want to show more than just like a character I want to show everything like in the world to understand so that I can understand what it's like sure yeah more of that process so I don't know is it a good idea to do like a general thing and show characters and show lighting and props and environment and map design or should i just focus mainly on, on one thing and, and just render that out it depends on where your skill set is um, you want to be practicing everything that you can but if you're trying to fast track uh, your way to a studio you should probably try to get good at something that you can market yourself as and that you basically pick whatever your passion is first um, all of the categories are hard so it doesn't matter if you think yeah. that characters or environments are easier. Mm -hmm. they're, they're both hard and take a long time to get good at. You wish. But um, when it comes to design thinking, you can totally have a portfolio that is only characters, um, but then supplement those characters with additional design work, right? So you, you, you can still completely think about the world at large. If you write a backstory, um, what is the history and the interactions between your protagonist and your villain? Is there anything in the costume design that reflects that? Is there any damage or scarring? 
what are the props that they use? Are there any tools that they use to interact with the world? That's a prop design right there. And you can also Ooh, add it okay. to the character. So okay. it's not that you need to go and make environments. It's that you can supplement your main focus with work that shows that you were thinking about it. Okay, so because I, I did that where I wrote a backstory of everything and I kind of um, planned out a little bit of what it was and I started to do, like, I don't know if it was like scope creep or something like that, but I was like, all right, cool, so I'll design, I don't know, like a PvP map where these guys will be at and then I'll design the characters of the bad guys and the good guys and then I'll design where the good guys are. Um, but that, you know, that was making a lot of work. So I was just wondering, and you know, you answered it pretty good, and that actually helped me out. Um, and I think I can cut down most of that stuff, and like you were saying, focus on how they interact with the world that they're in, and what they have, and what they use. Um, so that's pretty. That was pretty cool. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I also struggle with scope creep. <laughs> I'm very bad at at. Um assigning myself too much probably one of my favorite things to do is to think about the world building so i yeah. usually before i even start i've written you know like 50 pages thinking about interactions what are my story <laughs> beats how did they get there um, why are they there and then like what are the characters thinking is there anything that they used and i'm, I'm just i'm thinking about all that and then i end up giving myself too much to do so it's definitely yeah I Good to keep focused, but supplement where necessary. Yeah, I think I push it a little too epic sometimes. And I actually wanted to ask that as well because it's um, along the lines of finishing. Because this happens to me quite a bit to where... Um, sorry. Um, but it's, it's where you are on that story and you're doing it. And it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. How would you deal with like you know scope creep and not wanting to get all your ideas out and how how do you plan on what you want to have and what you don't want to have hmm. <laughs> maybe someone else could answer this question because i'm i'm just <laughs> as bad at doing that uh, i didn't oh, finish okay. i didn't finish my mentorship because i over scrape i over scoped um, way too much so i i don't have a good answer to be honest that's fine. It's, I just I have a few projects that I've done and then I just still look at them every time I open up Photoshop and I'm just like, oh man. So I can attest to like finishing a project. Um one of one plan that I have is I want to focus on the paintings, but I need to make sure that there's design work to go along with it. So I'm just going to go one at a time. I'm going to finish up one painting. That painting might have some props in it that I could design and I could make and to support and zoom in some call outs. And I'll just focus on that, uh, take as long as I need to get there. And when it's done, I'll release it. Um, then oh, okay. I've got 10 other paintings that I need to do, but I'm not going to worry about it all up front, you know? So. Yeah. Um, each painting is basically an excuse to be a full portfolio piece so I can yeah. make a painting uh, do call outs for the characters some specific props the buildings that are in that painting and turn what was this massive project into something where um, now each painting is its own project and I can get more mileage out of it okay and would you um, say if it was for portfolio I don't know if it's better to um, show progress over time or would you like you know say you did 10 paintings would you put all of those out on at once or would you do as you finish it you push it up put it up I'm gonna be releasing as I go instead of waiting releasing as you go okay yeah. okay mm-hmm well, thank you so much. That, that's a, that's all the questions I got. Sure, it's no problem. That's why we are here.
Do you ever use texture brushes as part of your finishing process? Yes. Or is that more towards the end? Oh, okay. Mm. At what point in that case would you say? Yeah, it's loosey goosey. I don't think that there's a defined thing. Um, if I want to add fair. texture, <laughs> like, you know, I, I'm thinking about shapes first, so texture is not really necessary, but there's definitely certain times where having texture is part of a rendering and it's going to get the job done faster. Um, we, we were doing studies in this group uh, a little bit ago, and I appear to have lost the painting. Um, ah, there it is. So, let's find it. Here. This was, uh, how much time was this, Scylla? Was it like 30 minutes? Um, this might feel rendered, like there's a lot of detail here, but that was like three strokes with the right brush. Um, so I'll find that. So there is that texture quality, which um, implied all of the foaming buildup in the water. And it's basically done in like two seconds. And that brush, for anyone curious, is in the Art of Ian brush pack. It's a great brush pack. It's more traditionally focused. That's where all of my the brushes that I use for texture come from. Did that help, Daha? Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, that's really nice. Thank you so much. We're coming up on 11 p.m. now, so I, I suppose we're getting close to a full hour. I didn't make it as far into this as I thought I would, but I'm going to uh, address highlights to kind of show the power of those and how quickly that can finish a render. Hey, uh, the uh, the. The person with the screen name Clammy, could you um, mute your mic? We're getting a lot of feedback on our side. Thank you. Alex, um, how are you going to go about the lighting? Are you doing overlay layer, or what are you doing? I'm using, uh, well, I pick different blend modes depending on a couple different scenarios. Mm -hmm. uh, I use. I use um, overlay, add, color dodge, and screen in all cases. Okay. Those are the four that I use. There are different times to use screen. I almost never use it because screen takes into account the main color that you pick and multiplies against that. So mm. uh, here's something that I like to demonstrate. So let's say we've got a cube. Round layer. And it's on screen, so it's too dark. Okay, so you want this to be indicated as wood. Um, when you use screen versus overlay, you get different effects. So let's say I use this warm yellow color to imply yellow light, sunlight. And I airbrush in and have it focus. Let's 
so that feels one way overall though oh that's normal sorry here's what happens on overlay and here's what happens on screen mm -hmm. so look at the difference in colors here um, the the reason why you would pick certain blend modes over another is because you know how they operate so screen is a multiply based blend mode where it's taking the values the, the numerical values of the color that you pick and the color underneath multiplying it together and getting a baseline result um, because of that it's taking equal account into the color that you pick and it usually ends up washing out the color underneath so because of that mm. I like using screen to lift values or use it for the Fresnel effect because Fresnel usually takes on the color of the ambient light which is more white um, so if you have a um, block of wood and you, it's been lit and stuff and then let's say you put a lacquer finish on top that's when you could use screen and basically pick your edges and start airbrushing in a bit of Fresnel towards edges mm. so because it's washing out it's implying how that same effect that we looked at earlier where the light kind of um, it desaturates the light is more prominent rather than the color of the object underneath and then overlay mm -hmm. takes into account the color underneath more strongly than it does the color that you're uh, painting with so instead it's basically like trending it towards your color while maintaining what's underneath so you might pick overlay for most materials but it's not going to work well on dark colors because it's taking into consideration the dark first and that's when mm. i would pick color dodge or add because it's essentially that but stronger um, it, you know, color dodge and add are very strong blending modes. Oh, right. Okay. Um, so I guess then, just for like the the gem on the uh, on the sword, how how are you going about? Yeah, I'll do that right now. So, I have the main shadow side, and then I. The things, the properties that you want in a well rendered gem is going to be the shadows, the refraction, and edge lights and Fresnel. So, refraction, that's going to be using something like overlay and thinking about the color that's in here. And there's light that is bouncing around here, and you're going to be able to see it on the underside. So you might pick to do something like this and then leave the edges darker because they're being they're being trapped. Um, there's more geometry overlap in this sort of thing. So you get some refraction and then you're gonna do some stuff like this. I might add this and then erase out some details, get some like just imply some extra stuff then still got my color dodge layer so you're going to use color dodge because it's really strong but i won't be using a warm light i'm going to be using warm according to blue so that i maintain the blue structure and i add those uh, edge highlights then when you really want to like render render you can start adding scratches and blemishes and things like that 
but in general highlights show us material properties so if you indicate those highlights you can indicate edges and um, tell material which makes things feel finished bye Braden So I'll give this uh, 10 more minutes, I think, is when we started, and then probably call it. So what I'm thinking here with this highlight is I'm thinking about the light direction and how it's coming down from the top. Um, generally, I kind of just roll with that and add that highlight in a central location, kind of where I'd think the center of the peak is. And you can kind of see me thinking about this rule in most of these places, where the peak of the highlight is where I think the geometry kind of uh, reaches its apex. So I've got that highlight in there and then I'm just gonna erase against it some. Which gives a little bit of shape to it, which I had pointed out in the League of Legends uh, study. Introduce some bounce light from the sword onto that gold there. Uh, caps earlier. How does that um, 
apply to this rendering process, would you say? It doesn't necessarily apply to the rendering, but to the design of the sword itself, oh. which I included um, here. So caps are the idea that um, everything needs a everything needs a starting point and an ending point rather than just being left alone. So in the Paul Richards example, what would have been a square block in the handle, you can add um, points to it that taper that's been capped. You can add a physical cap by doing this and then transition by cutting, adding a cap to this, repeating some lines and you can kind of uh, cap that jewel. You can kind of get to that sort of design idea very easily just by thinking about those three rules. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Mm Hi, Tony. Okay, I'll probably call it there. Um, didn't make it as far as I hoped, but you know, it's something. So, main ideas that I got to here were to indicate material and show geometry with shadow shapes. So all that was really was a shadow layer on the plants and then indicating highlight material on the sword itself. So edge highlights, a little bit of gradients, some bounce light and refraction. And you know, with enough time, I would spend a lot more cleaning that up at a certain point, you don't need to mess with blending modes anymore. Once every, once all the groundwork is laid in, there would be a point where I would just condense this down to one layer 
and go in and start manually cleaning things up and designing those shapes uh, more, more than they were. Um, if I were to keep going, before I rendered on a little more, there would be stuff that I'd want to include, like uh, transitioning to the implied shadow by uh, showing us a little bit more on some rocks that are in shadow, a couple trees, and some flowers. I, want, I was thinking of having some fish running through here. I also wanted to put some like gold doubloons showing that maybe this was valuable or treasures and um, I did have the thought of having like a skeleton hand and like a, a dude that you know didn't make it I don't know but basically transitioning this area getting some reflections and crests and showing the Fresnel in the water and then that would be pretty close to being what I would consider finished maybe some I was also thinking because this is here I would show Ivor with the overlay layer that wind effect um, emphasizing this gestural line or you could even go with more materials and add small leaves in the wind which also means that you could add leaf buildup elsewhere some leaves in the water to really pull this together and start thinking about all the stuff that's actually happening in this scene so that also gives you some great gestural opportunity the big and small idea from Paul Richards show really small shapes next to large ones to get an even an even better sense of scale follow that gestural line so it's already clear and simple it's an S curve and maybe like a, I had him in my sketch but a, a butterfly sitting on the sword so still stuff to be done but I figured you guys might be curious about rendering materials and that can be another talk at a later date in which we would go about just rendering materials or rendering things that are frequent in environments like trees and showing how to do that so that's been a full hour since the lecture finished up. I hope you guys found this useful. I, I am done talking, so thank you very much, guys. <laughs> that was very insightful. Thank you so much. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Alex. Nice job. Thank you Thanks, too. man. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, great Thanks. job, dude. <clears throat> oh, thank you, Kenny. <laughs> it's my art dad. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> he's right. It's he's our art dad. All of us. <laughs> <laughs> art. <laughs>